Man, is it a good day to be a cowboy on this Monday morning. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the gray area with Grayson Singleton. Thank you for watching this on the OkaliTV.com, as well as the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, or wherever you might be finding your podcast. We are going to talk about Oklahoma State football after the big win over Kansas State. Also, Bill Maher is making some very interesting comments on the NFL's Inspire Change campaign, and of course, Week 3 Power Rankings. Welcome in, everybody. Let's start with this. Where are the Spencer, where are the Spencer Sanders haters now? <laughs> Nowhere to be found, as the junior quarterback from Denton, Texas, threw for 340 passing yards this week in, the OS, in OSU's first Big 12 game against Kansas State. The team won 31-20. to Obviously, they didn't score in the second half, but we're, we're, we're going to gloss over that. Spencer Sanders completed his second consecutive game without a turnover. And if, you're, and if you're wondering, well, what's so important about that? That is something Spencer Rattler at the rival OU has not done. So, take, so there's, a, there's a moral victory there. Here's the thing about Oklahoma State. Last week, I talked about how I thought the game against Boise State was their best coached game that I have seen in my two years here at Oklahoma State University, meaning that they came into the game against Boise State knowing that the team did not have a great pass defense. However, they had to abandon course because there were no receivers. Well, the receivers were back. Jaden Bray was back. Tate Martin was back to the tune of nine receptions for 100 yards and, and, and a touchdown as well in the second quarter. But the way that Casey Dunn and Mike Gundy, after hinting that there were going to be big, major changes coming this week, well, they delivered. They unlocked Spencer Sanders. And you saw Spencer Sanders' skill set at its best. He can actually throw the ball. And with receivers who can get open and provide him with a catch radius that is, that is rather, rather usable, he can make throws. And he can stay out of trouble. We talk about... The Tulsa game, the game, a game that I actually called, and a lot of times we were noticing that he was throwing very ballsy, gutsy throws to where, yes, they were being completed, but boy, were they almost six the other way. Today, and la or last, last Saturday, Spencer Sanders did none of that. The only balls that could have remotely been intercepted were ones that went off the receiver's hands. The, the, guy, the guy was clean. He, he managed the offense, he ran for a touchdown, he used his legs to the Oklahoma State benefit, and now people who are campaigning for the reemergence of Shane Illingworth into the starting lineup are just mute because they can't. And here's the thing about holding a job that, it, that commands such a limelight as Spencer Sanders does. Somebody is always wanting to take your job, and there are always a large sector of a given population that wants said guy to take your job. Now, don't get me wrong. Spencer Sanders has not been fantastic over the last year plus. He's been turnover prone. Now, part of that has been a product of his offensive line and sometimes of receivers just not running the right route. He's not perfect. But he provides so much more of a ceiling, and I think we're starting to realize this after a game against Kansas State where the offense exploded for 24 points in a half, something that we have not seen in quite a long time, probably since Corndog was the quarterback here. And maybe you could probably go further, further back than that to Mason Rudolph or even Brandon Whedon. And yes, there is a little bit of bias here. Yes, I am always probably going to be rooting for a black quarterback to succeed, particularly a black quarterback in the middle of nowhere Oklahoma, where, let's just, let, well, let's, let's just say it like it is. In the South, there's going to be a heightened level of scrutiny. We all, we all know this. Some of us play a part in it. But you're seeing that Sanders has elevated this team from hardly ever being ranked to going all the way up to number six and now making an appearance at number 19 in each of his first two full seasons as the starter. And part of that is, in, is due in part to his added dimension to this offense. Because here's the thing. You have a shaky at best offensive line. Well, let, let me take that back. It's anemic. The offensive line is bad. You need a mobile quarterback to conduct your offense to some semblance of functionality. 
to offset that. That is not something Shane Illingworth, the sophomore quarterback from Napa, California, has. He's, as he's like Stephen A. Smith would say, as slow with a snail with arthritis, and snails don't have joints. Whereas Sanders' arm probably is even a little more livelier. So he checks all the boxes, not to mention he is comfortable with this offense, which I don't know how you could be comfortable behind that offensive line, but Spencer Sanders seems to be able to do it. I don't know how. Let's also talk about Jalen Warren. As Jalen Warren, we talk about taking people's jobs. Jalen Warren has snatched the running back one job from senior L.D. Brown. And L.D. Brown was supposed to be the replacement to Chuba Hubbard after last year in terms of of spelling Hubbard was a much more explosive running back as the future fifth fifth round pick of the Carolina Panthers struggled with injuries to his knees, ankles, and so on and so forth last season, as well as ball security issues. Well, LD Brown, his running style also doesn't work behind this offensive line in contrast to Jalen Warren's, who does. It's night and day. So what the coaching staff has decided to do, and I have maligned this coaching staff ever since I got here. They're conservative, they're vanilla, not very creative in terms of managing an offensive game plan, but they are putting the guys in that fit the skill set of the guys that they have. And what I mean by that is that L.D. Brown's running style is more conducive to an offensive line that can actually consistently develop holes. Excuse me. Jalen Warren just hits the hole and hits a sliver wherever he sees it, which is what you have to do to get upfield in the running game against an offensive line that doesn't really open up obvious holes. Now, does L.D. Brown still have value? And yes, he missed the game due to injury on Saturday, but he still has value out of the backfield and providing a change of pace back, not to mention as a kick returner, as we saw in the Tulsa game two weekends ago. But the coaching staff has decided to ride the hot hand of Jalen Warren, and coincidentally, that hot hand is what will win behind a cold offensive line. So so the takeaways from the game are this. The coaching staff is actually is actually figuring out how to correctly use Spencer Sanders and yes, it took a year and 3 games to be able to consistently do this and maybe we saw flashes of it against Miami before they reverted back to the archaic ways against Tulsa and against Boise State not particularly by choice. But Spencer Sanders and this is why I said on my podcast with Landon Buffet, can be a dark horse Heisman candidate if he continues to take care of the ball like that. In three starts, he has one turnover. And if the offensive line can provide him some semblance of even remotely being protected, Spencer Sanders doesn't turn the ball over that much when that is the case. So goodbye, Shane Illingworth campaigners and lobbyists. Because Spencer Sanders' job is here, it is secure, as long as he keeps playing like this, we will not be seeing number 16. All right, man, it's a fantastic day to be a Cowboy, number 19 in the country. This next weekend, going up against number 21, Baylor, I will be on the pregame coverage. Also right here on Ocali TV, along with Alex Dusky and I think Ian Nickel. I don't know, we'll see who it is. But anyway, let's transition to this. This season, the NFL, in its continued effort to promote social change and inclusion, has added Lift Every Voice and Sing to its weekly playing of the Star Spangled Banner across all NFL stadiums. And for a while, and, and, for, and really, for a league in which black people make up an overwhelming majority of the players, actually to the tune of 53%, this seems like it might be a cool idea in terms of representing the people who actually make you money. But someone, well, Bill Maher, on his show Real Time with Bill Maher on HBO, had some pretty interesting comments. One national anthem. I think when you go down a road where you're having two different national anthems, colleges sometimes now have, many of them, have different graduation ceremonies for black and white, separate dorms. This is what I mean, segregation. First of all, (laughs) colleges are not segregating graduations. Schools of interest, namely Columbia University in New York City, in New York, have offered additional ceremonies, multicultural ceremonies, in addition to the standard ceremony, and they did this in 2021. It's almost, it's almost like fraternities and sororities. You have the standard ones here at Oklahoma State, but you also have offshoots of them that are multicultural and are geared more inclusively and probably 
more favorably to minorities and other people that ident with other identifications, be it sexual orientation, religion, or what have you. Not to mention that the Columbia, the, that the Columbia offering of these graduations was misrepresented by pretty much everybody. Because to like what Bill Maher said in his understanding is that they were segregating the, say, segregating the standard graduation, which maybe he wasn't representing that, but, it, but judging on the verbiage, that's how that sounds. Anyway, maybe, does Bill Maher in comparing playing Lift Every Voice and Sing to segregation by race, which obviously we all know by now is bad, does Bill Maher not quite understand what is going on with the playing of what is known as the Black National Anthem? So today, we're going to go through the history of Lift Every Voice and Sing and also go back to Bill Maher later because the HBO host has a very interesting take on national anthems in general. But let's start with, let's start with what exactly is Lift Every Voice and Sing. And it is written as a poem similar to how Francis Scott Key composed The Star Spangled Banner. It was written as a five stanza poem by James Weldon Johnson, an American activist and ed an educator as, where, as well. It was first performed in the United States in 1900 at a celebration of President Lincoln's life on the former president's birthday. And it was uh, actually adopted as the Black National Anthem for full 12 years in 1919 before the Star Spangled Banner was adopted as the United States National Anthem. One of, of note right there. As for the content of, of, excuse me, of the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing, it's quite a beautiful poem. And if you haven't heard it, and I don't have time to, to analyze the, lytic, the lyrics today, but I really urge you to go and at least view the lyrics, to, if not listen to the song, because it is quite a beautiful composition. It's a poem that details the struggles of African Americans since they came here in America, but it also details the African American commitment to God in terms of bringing them through these trials of slavery, uh, Jim Crow, and then the segregation that was going on when the song was first adopted by the NAACP as the, as the national anthem of the African American community. It also reiterates, so maybe surprisingly enough, a commitment to the United States as the term native land or something similar is, it was written multiple times. And that, and that is key because black people, after basically building this country's infrastructure and economy off of their own blood, sweat, and tears and bodies, view this country also as our native land now. Obviously the motherland is back in Africa, but every African American is still an American today. And having that commitment in, their na in that national anthem, in our national anthem, is very key to, in to promoting a unity amongst other Americans, as well as coexistence, as when we, talk, when we go back to the context of the, 19, of the early 1900s and the early 20th century. Conversely, the Star Spangled Banner. So let's compare the two, the two national anthems. The Star Spangled Banner, which was adopted in 1931 as the United States National Anthem, 12 years after Lift Every Voice and Sing, was adopted as the Black National Anthem. Now, the Star Spangled Banner is also quite a poetic composition by Francis Scott Key, written during the War of 1812. It was actually detailed the story of that war and how, even though the country seemed all but lost, the United States survived the British yet again. Both the, Nash, both the Star Spangled Banner and Lift Every Voice and Sing state a commitment to God and the United States. And if you don't see a commitment to God in the Star Spangled Banner, I'm analyzing the entire composition, not just the stanza that we sing for our national anthem so, so frequently in, in this country. Both also hint at, a, at the legacy, at the United States legacy of slavery. And I cannot stress that enough. In both national anthems, the, the legacy of slavery is highly visible, except that's where these two divert paths. The Black National Anthem details the, details the story of slavery as a story of perseverance through trial, through tribulation, and actually protest by peace to gain equality and basic human rights and basic human justice. However, the Star Spangled Banner mentions this as a construct of America. 
there, in the Star Spangled Banner's third stanza, it says, quote, no refuge could save the hireling and the slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave, close quote. Now, if you don't know what that means, first of all, congratulations on being basic because I don't either. <laughs> Thankfully, there are people who have analyzed this composition from the early 1800s. Mark, Clay, Mark Clogg, an associate professor of, music, of museology and American culture at the University of Michigan, says, quote, I think slaves is a reference to the colonial Marines who were slaves held captive by the Americans that escaped and were offered the opportunity to fight on the British side to earn freedom. Close quote. So, what, so to put it in, in layman's terms, America, Americans would sometimes make their slaves serve as colonial Marines. However, or excuse me, the, their slaves escaped and were serving as colonial Marines in the British Army with hopes of having freedom. And basically what you see in this stanza, this cannot save the slave from terror of flight or the gloom of the grave, is that this is basically a threat to American slaves who decided to desert the United States and go fight for the British in hopes of having freedom. Now if, now, if that sounds very bad to you, I'm glad, because it is. Now, obviously, most people do not know that's in the, in the National Anthem, the Star-Spangled Banner, because we don't sing that stanza. But there is also another stanza in the Star-Spangled Banner that is dropped completely, and hardly any of us know it. And the reason why is because once the United States and the Great Britain became allies in the 20th century, the, that part was viewed as such a flagrant mockery to, the, to England that they had to drop it all together in order to promote peace between the former rival nations. As a matter of fact, if you read the entire poem that Francis Scott Key wrote, you can see that the Star Spangled Banner after the first stanza is a complete mockery of the British in their defeat in the War of 1812. Basically a war that almost accomplished nothing. So basically, lift every, vo lift every voice and sing is an ode to perseverance and an ode to of overcoming trials, whereas the Star Spangled Banner, outside of its commitment to God and commitment to the United States and the, and the flag of the United States, is almost a petulant mockery of, and a display of what we now know and view in sports terms, because I'm a sports commentator, as poor sportsmanship, even though I know sports and war are not the same thing and probably should not be compared. Now this, now, so now we have an issue where you have the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing, and the United States National Anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, and which brings us back to Bill Maher. And well, he has another extremely interesting take when it comes to the clash of anthems. And finally, new rule, the only time there should be two national anthems is when the other team is from Canada. Years ago, I opined that it was fine to get rid of the old anthem. We just shouldn't have two. Now, <laughs> I don't believe we should enforce patriotism by singing anything. And if there's one thing I hate more than groupthink, it's audience participation. <laughs> but I am what you might call an old school liberal who was brought up with the crazy idea that segregating by race is bad. That's what I was talking about. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and again, when it comes to an anthem, it doesn't have to be the one we currently use, but it has to be just one. You know, because it's a national anthem. Okay. Bill Maher has a point here. Yes, there should only be one national anthem. I agree. It's a national anthem. The only time you should have two national anthems is if a team from Canada is visiting a team from the United States, as I believe Maher also said. Yes, there should only be one national anthem. And he leaves the possibility and the door open for a possible new national anthem, which, based on the information that I just gave you about the current one, there is merit to. And it's not liberalist to, to, ins to insinuate that, just based off pure analysis of the two poems. Now, do you have to make lift every voice and sing the new national anthem? You don't, you don't have to if, if you choose to get rid of the current one at all. But it is, but it is a similarly beautiful poem that is probably more maturely written. Anyway, back to also, also and his, and his uh, statement on forced patriotism, which is something I have talked about in the past on my old show, In Focus with Grace and Singleton. And this is something I feel strongly about, which is strange about the United States of America, is that there is a lot of forced patriotism, which is different from many other countries. So, 
So the fact that Bill Maher believes that we don't need to be singing anything, which is a direct echo of something I said a few months ago when Mark Cuban decided not to play the national anthem at Dallas, at Dallas Mavericks game, we do not need to sing the national anthem before every single event. That is, that, that is just a fact. That, that's, that's just strange. Nobody else in the world does that, believe it or not. So, the, so this whole forced patriots, the patriotism thing, which has taken on many, many different masks over the years, particularly in the last five, once after, and especially in the years after Colin Kaepernick's demonstration, which we won't touch on, but you guys probably, probably already know my stance on that. You, we don't really know how much people actually think about the country because we've forced them to participate in certain particular events and demonstrations. Now, Back to the NFL's con inclusion of "Lift Every Voice and Sing," which is the real topic of this, uh, which is the which is the real topic of the segment. Here's what Bill Maher gets slightly wrong here, and there's a lot of interesting things that we've unpacked in the two statements that Bill Maher has said. The first is that it's not sowing seeds of dissension. As a matter of fact, it's not intended to. It's rather it's rather unifying, not to mention giving more exposure to different cultures. And that's what I think some people in the United States lack, is that some people, white, black, Latino, or whatever, grow up in, an, in a sector of society where you have no exposure to anything else. And quite frankly, and I'm just going to say this from, from the <laughs> perspective of a black person, if you haven't experienced any even some symbols of black culture, I really encourage you to, because it will change your world. Anyway, anyway, Exposure to other cultures and exposure to things that are good or are different than yours is never a bad thing. Why do you think people always say when they get money they want to travel the world and see different things? Because it's exciting. And playing Lift Every Voice and Sing, and you watch the, and you watch the players' faces and the coaches' faces, some of whom have never heard this, this song before, and you can see the mystified gazes as they actually think about the words of this song and hear it played to them. So there's nothing wrong with more exposure, and it's also bringing more unity together because it is bringing the cultures together under one roof or under one sky in one particular venue for three hours of a, or three and a half hours of a football game. It is also serving as an educator to people who allow it. And a lot of times when we see people and leagues and organizations try to foster and promote inclusion, People reject it because it's something different. But if you allow it to, it can actually present a separate perspective of what you are already used to, which, again, can never actually hurt unless you're just presenting yourself with verified false information. So what, so, so what, what have we learned today? Well, first of all, forced patriotism is never okay. And quite frankly, it is, that is one of the things that I believe really taints the true attitude of the United States of America is that there is a lot of forced patriotism. If you, if you don't express your emotion for the country, God knows what you can be called. I've seen it before with my own two eyes in person. Number two, look, no, we, we should not have two national anthems. That, that, that's a fact. We should, there should not be two national anthems. And we also should not be afraid to challenge the current one. As a matter of fact, there are plenty of things in our country right now that you should not be afraid to challenge. There is a vaccine mandate that just went out. People are going to challenge it, and that's okay. When you challenge things and through inquisition and inquiry, that's how things get better, and that's how we find out really how the country is supposed to work. And this works with every sector of society, not just at the governmental or patriotic level. And number three, look, fostering inclusion can sometimes come with hiccups. Has the NFL had some hiccups? Has the NBA had some bumps in the road in it when it comes to their social justice movements? Yes, not everything is going to be perfect. But one of the concepts that I, that I adhere to in my life is that for goodness sake, try something. That you can always, you can always make mistakes. Some of, them, some of them are going to be a little bit more dire than others and you have to wonder what on earth were you thinking. But sometimes things will go wrong. Guess what? Try something else. Just, tr just try something. If you see a problem, there's, there's, no merit, there's no merit to an individual when you see a problem and do nothing. Okay? So try something for crying out loud. But, but I'll, leave, I'll leave this segment with this and then we'll get to some power rankings. Playing Lift Every Voice and Sing is part of this new strategy of the NFL's Inspire Change initiative. 
On the backs of helmets this season are the phrases in fire change and in racism. They are also inscribed in the backs of every end zone in all 32 stadiums. And the result here now is that there's no controversy. Even though I didn't have a problem with kneeling, I think it is a constitutionally protected demonstration because of its legality. And this goes back to the forced patriotism topic as well. Because this is a constitutionally protected act, it somehow came with a bunch of controversy. There's no kneeling now. It is just inspire change and end racism. And other than that, it's just football. Just the pure American football that we have grown to love over the sports 100 years of existence. And something slick that the NFL did was that it removed any possible controversy from its Inspire Change initiative. Let me explain. And the reason why is this. If the phrases inspire change and in racism bother you, if it angers you, if it disturbs you, if it makes you uncomfortable, inspire change and end racism, then maybe you need to look inward and figure out if you and your heart is part of the problem. If you don't want to inspire change and end the heinous belief system and disease that is racism. All right, good stuff. We'll close the show with power rankings. So last week I did my first power rankings, which was for week two. This is the week three power rankings. And we'll start with some honorable mentions this week because this time I had time to prepare them. And the two, and the two that were left out were the Denver Broncos and the Green Bay Packers. Denver is 3-0 and with one of the league's best defenses, a top five defense. They have two straight games of forcing multiple turnovers against the top two picks in this, in this past draft, Trevor Lawrence and Zach Wilson. Their offense is also putting up points as well. Now, you can argue that Denver may not be legit because the teams that they have faced, the Giants, Jaguars, and Jets, are a combined 0-9. But guess what? You have to play the teams that are in front of you, and Denver has a huge test coming up against Baltimore next Sunday. So we'll see. But for the time being, the Denver Broncos have not played down to their competition, and a 26-0 shutout of the New York Jets proves it right there. Also just missing the cut, the Green Bay Packers. And the Packers had to basically rebound from their anemic showing against the New Orleans Saints, a team that was relocated because of of Hurricane Irma, or not Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Ida, and then took it to Green Bay after Aaron Rodgers' tumultuous offseason. Well, after that, Aaron Rodgers has been nothing short of absolutely fantastic, thrashing the Detroit Lions in the second half and then leading the San Francisco, leading the Packers on a, on a drive that lasted 37 seconds and a last-second field goal culminated the comeback win over San Francisco in Week 3. So, Looks like Aaron Rodgers is pretty much invested in the Green Bay Packers. So Green Bay and Denver narrowly missed the cut. Here we go, top 10. Number 10, Tennessee. And they are, they're now 2-1, and and they're 2-0 after their week one beatdown at the hands of the Arizona Cardinals. They're 2-1 and and now lead the AFC South after their win over the Indianapolis Colts, who are just hampered with injuries, not, not excluding quarterback Carson Wentz. The thing with the Titans, though, they need to start getting turnovers. They only have one through the first three games, and that was an interception. They don't force fumbles. They still really don't get after the quarterback particularly well. So their defense is going to have to be be playing a lot better and be more opportunistic for them to start taking down the Titans, no pun intended, of the AFC. Number nine, Baltimore. And last week I had them at number seven, but you do not get a boost for barely beating the Detroit Lions and probably surviving due to a missed delay of game call at the end of the game. (laughs) Justin Tucker's 66-yard game, game-winning field goal was, the, was a new NFL record, and it was what sunk the lines as the ball bounced off of the crossbar and through the uprights to deny new Lions coach Dan Campbell his first win with his new team. Number eight, the Raiders. They're 3-0, and and they were not ranked in my, last, in my power rankings last week, but an overtime win against Miami, who is a quality opponent with a quality defense, even though they were missing their starting quarterback, is, is a phenomenal win that elevates you to 3-0. and And their defense, which was, which, which was their Achilles heel, and which is why I was not high on the, on the Las Vegas Raiders, has come out to play. They have a pass rush. Derek Carr is an early season MVP candidate. And this is their first 3-0 and start since 2002. They lost the Super Bowl that year, Super Bowl 37, to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, who were coached by, coincidentally, John Gruden. 
Let's go to number seven. Number seven, the Carolina Panthers. And they have not also been 3-0 since they, too, lost the Super Bowl in 2015. They went 15-1 that year. Cam Newton was the MVP, but they lost Super Bowl 50 to my Denver Broncos. They were not ranked last week, but again, 3-0. You have the best defense in the league. You can make it in the top 10. 3-0 with the best defense. Now, however, even though they have Sam Darnold, they have to replace Christian McCaffrey, who is on the shelf at least for a couple of weeks with a hamstring injury. They also have to replace one of their starting corners, rookie J.C. Horn, who is the eighth pick in this spring's NFL draft. They have seemed to start that plan because they acquired Jack's former Jacksonville Jaguars corner and former top pick, top 10 pick, C.J. Henderson from Jacksonville in exchange for tight end Dan Arnold. They did this probably an hour before I came on this show. So Carolina 3-0 is number seven. Number six, Cleveland Browns, and they were number four last week. They didn't drop due to anything with them. They just dropped because of the drop of somebody ahead of them and somebody that was behind them making an absolutely incredible performance in week, in week three, but I'll get to them in a second. Cleveland in their win over Justin Fields and the Chicago Bears and Matt, Nag and Matt Nagy's just inept um, play calling and game plan. Matt Nagy, for number one, on a side, if they lose to Detroit next week, Matt Nagy should be fired on next Monday. I'll, I'll say that. Miles Garrett is again showing that he's a defensive player of the year candidate. He had seven tackles, four and a half sacks, as the defense registered nine in total, also thanks to two from Jadavion Clowney, and just basically rocked the Bears and held Justin Fields to a completion percentage of 30 and a QBR of nine. It was an abysmal performance for the first, for the, in the first start for the rookie quarterback, and thanks in large part to the Cleveland Browns defense, which is ferocious and will get better as the season goes on. Into the top five we go. Number five, the Kansas City Chiefs, the defending AFC champions. They are now one and two. They have a losing record after three games and are trending down after losing to a Chargers team that made every effort to lose the game. And here's the thing about the Chargers, who maybe could make an appearance next week or the week after. They beat themselves so much, and they just beat the AFC champions and the team that has won the AFC West for the last five years. Patrick Mahomes is starting to look very, very weird, and he's playing at a strange clip, meaning he's turning the ball over more so than often, and he's still trying to make these Batman-like plays, but now NFL defenses are being more opportunistic when he tries to do so. Also, <laughs> after a fumble by Clyde Edwards-Hilaire in the second quarter, the Chiefs had turned the ball over four times in the team's last 13 plays, dating back to the Week 2 loss against Baltimore. So Kansas City right now, their defense is atrocious. They're, it's, it's a terrible unit right now. They can't stop the pass, and they're getting gashed on the ground. But if their offense can start to take care of the football a little bit better and not be so lackadaisical with it, also we wish and Andy Reid the best, the best as he recovers from a dehydration episode in the game and a stay at, at Kansas City Hospital, this, this team can start to look a little bit better and we can return to their form that got them to the Super Bowl each of the last two seasons. Number four, Arizona. Last week they were number five. They go up to four with the loss, with Kansas City's drop. And their defense has finally started to play. They came out with a pick six uh, yesterday against Jacksonville by Byron Murphy. And their defense, which we thought was going to be bad, has provided one of two things in each of the first three games. Either a pass rush or their secondary has been phenomenal. Their offense is a mainstay. Their offense is going to score 30 points every single game unless they just run into a buzzsaw that is a defense, possibly against the Rams when they go up against them twice this season in the future. But for right now, now the defense has to put everything together and they will be a legitimate Super Bowl contender in the NFC because their offense is just virtually unstoppable to this point. Number three, Buffalo. And last week I had them at six, but they dispelled any sort of notion that they are on the downside. They are they they won 43 to 24 over the Washington football team and a football team's defense who has just not shown up. I was high on Washington and I thought they were going to go around 12 and 5, 13 to 4 because I thought you couldn't score on them. Buffalo basically shot that to hell. The the offense and the offense after looking rather pedestrian in the first couple of games exploded. Josh Allen is looking like the early season MVP candidate. I thought he was. He's my pick to win the win the MVP, and through the first three, three weeks, that's probably not going to happen. But now Buffalo has to worry about getting a running game going and settling their backfield, whether it will be Zach Moss or Devin Singletary in their, in, as their lead back. But if that gets settled, the defense is playing absolutely fantastic, and the offense just ran roughshod over a top-five defensive unit in the league. 
I think Buffalo will be just fine, and they can contend to represent the AFC for the fifth time in the franchise history in the Super Bowl. To the exciting top two, and number two is Tampa Bay. Last week they were number one. This week they lost to the Rams, so guess what? You get dropped to number two. And look, their defense, I, look, we can't say enough about Tom Brady. <laughs> Tom Brady has been absolutely fantastic. He has 12 touchdown passes through the first three games. Their defense is a complete 180. It's an atrocity. It is horrible. It cannot be any worse. Yes, they were missing Jason Pierre-Paul, and now they're missing one of their corners, Sean Murphy Bunting, and will await to see the medical diagnosis of Jamel Dean after getting injured at SoFi Stadium yesterday. But they're, they can't stop anybody. They're not getting a whole lot of pressure. They're getting gashed on the ground by a team that was down to its second running back and has a thin offensive line, and they can't cover anybody. So there's a lot of work that Todd Bowles has to do with that defense in order to get Tampa Bay back to the Super Bowl and, a and give Tom Brady a chance for ring number eight. And that leaves us at number one. My pick to win the Super Bowl, the Los Angeles Rams. And of course, they were two last week. They beat Tampa Bay 34-24 to yesterday, so they move up to number one. And it seems like the early returns are in on Matthew Stafford over Jared Goff. He's been phenomenal. He is an early MVP candidate as well. And he's the third quarterback or the sixth quarterback, excuse me, since 1950 for the Rams to throw nine touchdown passes in his first three games with the franchise. The defense, and look, we cannot say enough about Aaron Donald and Jalen Ramsey, arguably two of the top five defenders in the National Football League, one of the greatest of all time at their respective positions. But if the defense continues to play like it is, holding opponents to 24 points and below, and this offense continues to just scheme their way and make defenses, opposing defenses look like they're running around like chickens with their heads cut off, the Rams are going to win the Super Bowl in their own stadium, making it the second time in as many years that a team has done that after Tampa Bay won Super, won Super Bowl 55 at Raymond James Stadium in Florida. All right, that'll do it for me today. Thank you for, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening to The Gray Area, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Ocali TV, and on, so, and on some occasions, we'll put this thing on YouTube as well. Wherever you get your podcast, my name is Grayson Singleton. God bless. Keep cool. And we'll see you next week. Take it easy, everybody.